Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Employment Case Law Update. My name is Lusanda Rapulu. I'm a partner in the Employment Practice and head of the Disputes Resolution Department. If you're a regular attendee of this case law update, you'll know that it's ordinarily facil facilitated by Graham Demand. But Graham has entrusted me with this job this morning. Before we dive into the webinar, I would like to run through a few housekeeping matters, which will hopefully enhance this webinar experience for all of you. As participants, you are all automatically muted and the chat functionality has been disabled. So should you have any questions during the webinar, please make sure that you use the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Your questions will be submitted to me as a facilitator, and I will select some questions to discuss with the relevant panel members at an appropriate time during the webinar. Please note, we will not be providing written responses to the questions. This webinar is being recorded, and a copy of the recording will be made available on our website later today at www.bowmanslaw.com. In addition, a copy of the recording, as well as a list of the cases that are discussed this morning, will be emailed to you. Welcome to all of you. On top of our many attendees from South Africa, we're pleased to welcome attendees from Kenya, Nigeria, the United States, the United Arab Emirates, Mauritius, Lesotho, the United Kingdom, and India. Okay, let's get into it. As a starting point, many of you will know that have, there have been amendments to the Employment Equity Act. Some of these amendments have been well received and some not so well received, with some making clear that they intend to take legal action. To start off, off this morning, our senior partner in the employment practice, my colleague Talita Lapsha, will take us through an overview of the amendments to the Employment Equity Act. Over to you, Talita. Thank you, Lou. Good morning, everyone. It is great to be with you this morning. The much anticipated Employment Equity Act Amendment Bill was signed into law by President Ramaphosa on the 6th of April. And yes, it has caused a lot of writing in the newspapers and as Lysander saying, um, organizations and certain sectors who are feeling that um, this, these amendments go too far and they will be subject to legal challenge. We haven't seen any cases yet being instituted or launched, but we are keeping an eye on that and um, we will certainly let you know at our next label or update should we be aware of any of these matters being instituted already. One of the things that is really very well received under the amendments is the definition of a designated employer. You will be aware that in the past, well, currently, the Act provides that you are a designated employer if you employ more than 50 employees or if your annual turnover is higher than the prescribed uh, turnover. Now, this latter part of the definition has caused a lot of problems for companies that has a very high turnover, although they have very few employees, because that then made them a designated employer. And there is really very little room to maneuver when you have very few employees. So thankfully, that part of the definition will be deleted and the key factor will be the number of employees. So if you hit 50, then you are a designated employer and you will need to comply with the provisions of chapter three of the act. The part of the act that is causing a lot of anxiety is the minister's power to identify sectors and to publish sectoral targets and to require designated employers in those sectors to comply with those targets and the, the, the part that is really worrying is that if you fail to do so you cannot get the certificate um, of compliance in the event that you do business with the state. 
And there is a whole lot of uncertainty around what all of this means. Perhaps I can just start with the certificate issue. That has been part of the Employment Equity Act since its inception. So that is not actually an addition to the Act. Um, that section says that um, yes, where, where a designated employer comply, uh, does business with the state, so state contract, um, they must comply with chapters two and three, which means they mustn't unfairly discriminate under section uh, chapter two, and they must comply with the chapter three designated employer uh, provisions. If they're not a designated employer and you're doing business with the state, you must provide proof that you are not acting contrary to the provisions of chapter two. And then you need to get a certificate from the Minister of Labor confirming compliance with these two chapters. And this certificate is valid for 12 months from the date of issue until the next date on which you are obliged to submit your report in terms of section 21 of the Act. And a failure to comply with the provisions of the Act is sufficient ground for rejection of an offer to do business with the state. So this is an important um, section that is now due to come into effect. The sectoral targets that um, the minister will be entitled to publish has also caused anxiety, but we must now remember that these provisions are not yet in force. They has been talk and uh, articles in, in the reports in the papers that it is uh, due to come into effect on the 1st of September this year, but we do not know yet um, whether that is so and whether um, the act will actually take effect from then, but that is what's been reported previously. So there are no sectoral targets yet for anyone who has been worrying about that. Also, there is a whole process that would need to be followed in order to set these targets. The process is that there will need to be a publication of a notice specifying the sectors. Then once those sectors are identified, the minister must consult with these sectors and it needs to take advice from the National Minimum Wage Commission on what these targets and goals would be. Thirdly, there will be a notice in the Government Gazette setting out these targets and then allowing interested parties 30 days to comment. And only once that process is completed will the Minister be empowered to publish a notice in the Government Gazette setting the sectoral targets. Now, um, we've had questions whether these sectors have been published yet. And you may recall five years ago, there was a notice that uh, seeks to amend the regulations to the Employment Equity Act. That regulation has not yet been amended, but in that regulation, there are sectors um, that are proposed. So that would then be a new form EEA 17 once that is, that is approved. And just very, very broadly and quickly, the sectors that are listed there include agriculture, forestry and fishing, mining and quarrying, manufacturing, construction, financial and insurance activities, transportation and storage, um, information and communication, supply, uh, sewage waste management and remediation activities, electricity, gas, steam and air conditioning supply, human health and social work activities, arts, entertainment and recreation, real estate activities, professional, scientific and technical activities. That is where we will fall as a law firm. <laughs> 
um, wholesale and retail trade, repair of motor vehicles, motorcycles, accommodation and food service, so hospitality, public administration and defense, social security, education, and that would be pre primary, primary education, secondary, higher education, other education activities, and then administrative and support activities like renting and leasing of motor vehicles, renting and leasing of household goods, travel agency, tour operators, services to buildings such as cleaning, landscaping, all of those things would then fall under administrative and support activities. As I said, these are not yet finalized and will need to be published in the Government Gazette and will need to be um, then ultimately agreed upon and published in, uh, as, as part of the regulation. The second part is that you might be aware that there has been an effort by the department to engage with certain of these sectors. We are aware that there's been engagements with the financial sector, for example, on the setting of targets. And as part of that process, there were actually targets that were agreed. But those targets um, are outdated by now. So, and in any event, it is unlikely that the department would be able to rely on those targets because there was no empowering legislation that permitted those consultations at that stage. So our view is that the department would need to again consult and need to again revisit those targets. In the meantime, there's been COVID, there's been all kinds of developments, and these things would need to be taken into account in setting those targets. I think what is important here is that one must grab the opportunity to engage in order to set achievable, realistic, and sensible targets. There is no use of setting targets just with reference to one benchmark for the entire organization. I think this provides an opportunity for sectors to say, this is, this is our reality. This is our context. This is the pool of, potentially, of potential candidates um, that we need to look at. And these are the extra efforts that we are making in order to change the composition of the pool. And all of these things need to be taken into account in setting those targets. So that is an opportunity for business or all of these sectors to engage and to ensure that per occupational level you distinguish because this, the, the pool of available candidates per occupational level looks different. And the reasons for the difference are, are many factors. So one needs to engage properly and rationally in relation to the setting of targets at sector level. Then one um, gets to the point of developing your own employment equity plan. And it doesn't mean that now you can just simply apply the sector targets because the act places an obligation on the designated employer to consult with its employees who are representative of all employees in the workplace, all occupational categories, and to develop their own targets on a yearly basis and an overall goal um, to be achieved at the end of the plan. That obligation is not negated by the, the fact that there are sector targets in place. So it gives you another data point, but it doesn't take away the obligation to consult and then to actively work towards those goals and targets. Importantly, these sector targets, the goals and targets in your plan are, does that, they are not quotas. And we have seen a lot of enforcement activity from the Department of Labor. And we have seen a lot of suggestion that we, an employer isn't complying with the year one targets. Now, all of a sudden, they are non-compliant with the act. We do not think that such 
a simplistic approach is what is envisaged by the Employment Equity Act. And we think that what is required is a proper engagement on what the targets are, what the reasons are for not meeting those targets, what the other non-numerical measures are in place in order to empower people from designated groups and influence the pool of suitably qualified persons that can enter the job market. It is a much broader discussion than just a number chasing on a yearly basis. And I think there is room for engagement with the department on, on that basis and also for challenging um, court cases that might be brought and has been threatened by the department if an employer is seen to just not, not being um, complying with one of the years of, <laughs> of their plan, or even just in one of the occupational categories, not taking into account any other occupational uh, levels where there's been um, significant progress. So I think it is a, a holistic um, approach is needed and let us know if you need assistance there. Another thing that I think is very important is that in your plan, you need to set out your context. The pool that you are recruiting from, the um, nature of your business, whether or not you are multinational and you know might have expats in the country, all of those things need to be set up in the plan. We need to, as I say, take a holistic view of this issue and we need to explain what we are doing and importantly include those measures that you are taking to empower people from designated groups, training activities, bursaries, bursaries for workers, um, children, those kinds of uh, uh, initiatives, that's important. I will stop Great. there, Lou. Um, it's a mouthful, but yeah, reach out to us if, if you want to discuss this further. Thanks so much, Salita. Um, obviously, some relief there for employers less than 50 employees, but lots of food for thought in relation to the sector target. Um, and as you say, the amendments aren't in place yet, so there is time. Um, but also, even when they are in place, um, in terms of process and engagement, um, I think you've given lots of food for thought. I think you've been very thorough. No questions for you in the Q&A. Um, so we'll be moving on. Thanks, Salita. Um, up next, we've got Swusiso Dube. Swu is a partner in our employment practice, um, and he will be dealing with the case on the effects of aborted disciplinary hearings. Thanks, Swu. Thanks, Lou. Um, and good morning to everyone who's joining us this morning. Um, the, the first case that I'm looking at is the Department of International Relations uh, versus Lobsher and others. And really what this case is about is whether or not abandoning a disciplinary process amounts to an unfair labor practice. So this was a this is a labor appeal court case. Um, and essentially, you know, what the court needed to determine here is whether when an employer abandons a disciplinary process, whether that falls into the ambit of Section 186.2. Um, of the Labor Relations Act, which provides that an unfair labor practice includes any disciplinary action which is short of dismissal. Now, just a brief fact of this case, um, Mr. Lobsher was charged on several counts of misconduct in 2016, and the parties agreed that they would engage in a Section 188A process. Requests were made by Mr. Lobsher's attorneys for documents to be discovered by the company, as well as for a pre-arbitration conference to take place. Now, the department did not accede to this request, and an application to compel was then made by Mr. Lobsher's attorneys to the bargaining council. The bargaining council did not deal with the application, and this then resulted in Mr. Lobsher approaching the labor court on an urgent basis 
um, seeking relief that the bargaining council um, must hear or must set the matter down for pre-arbitration and that the employer must compel the documents that were sought. After all this litigation between the parties before the matter was even heard, the department then withdrew all the charges against Mr. Lobsher. Now, Mr. Lobsher felt very aggrieved by this, and he then referred an unfair labor practice dispute to the bargaining council, where essentially he was stating that the charges against him were frivolous, that there was no merit to them, and that his dignity had actually been impaired by the conduct of the employer. His argument was that the decision to charge him and then abandon the process amounted to an unfair labor practice. The bargaining council issued an award or a ruling in terms of which it held that it does not have jurisdiction to arbitrate the matter as it does not fall within the ambit of section 186. This was then taken on review by the company to the labor court. And what the labor court did is they, the, the judge found that there has to be a distinction between disciplinary action short of dismissal and a disciplinary sanction that is short of dismissal. Ultimately, the labor court found that the conduct of the company showed that there was no merit to the charges, that the company had been frivolous um, in charging the employee and later abandoning the case. And so it held that the company's conduct in abandoning the disciplinary process actually amounted to disciplinary action that is short of dismissal. The labor court then went further and actually adjudicated the unfair labor practice dispute and awarded compensation to the employee in the amount of around 498,738 Rand, as well as costs. This judgment was then taken on appeal and the LAC then had to determine the question whether or not um, abandoning a disciplinary process amounts to disciplinary action, which is short of dismissal. What the Labor Appeal Court found, and in considering Schedule 3 of the Code on dismissal, is that the phrase short of dismissal actually refers to a sanction that is short of dismissal. So in other words, a disciplinary inquiry which has not commenced or has been abandoned without a sanction actually being imposed on the employee cannot be equated to disciplinary action that is short of dismissal as contemplated in section 186 of the LRA. So the, labor, the, the LAC found that the labor court had actually erred in finding differently um, and in setting aside and reviewing the arbitration award. The LAC also went on further to state that the labor court actually should have stopped at the point of finding that the CCMA had jurisdiction and not gone further um, to, set, to, to, to substitute the arbitration award because the, the labor court has no jurisdiction to determine a ULP and the labor court cannot determine an issue that has to be resolved through arbitration. So the LAC, the LAC upheld the review and it set aside the arbitration award. So in a nutshell, um, if you do commence a disciplinary process against an employee as the employer and somewhere in between having brought the charges against the employee, you actually find that you might not be able to sustain the charges and you decide to withdraw them for whatever reason, that is not an unfair labor practice. And that is essentially what this case was about. Thank you, Sue. Um, good outcome for employers there coming out of, of the LAC. Um, Talita, I, I spoke too soon. Um, there's a question here for you. 
Uh, sorry, one question. How does one apply the less than 50 employees? Is it based on a specific point in time? Annual approved manpower plan? How do you prevent it being a moving target? If I have a plan and then fall below 50 employees, um, how does an employer do? Can an inspector deem the employer being over 50 um, as they have a submitted plan? So what happens if the number moves, basically? Yeah, this is tricky, but I think the, the important guidance uh, would probably be from Section 21, the report, um, and that is um, the section dealing with when you become a designated employer, um, and that is after the first working day of April, but before the first working day of October, then you must submit your report on the first working day of October in the following year. So I would think that you would need to do an assessment every year um, as soon as you become um, a designated employer. And I think, you know, it is clear, it says over 50. Um, let me just double check that. Yeah, who employs, okay, 50 or more. So 50 is the number. And I think, you need to assess that in that period between April and October. Um, if you are more than, than 50, then you will have an obligation to submit your report the next, the next year. I think, you know, it is something that could be manipulated by employers and the court will probably take a, a dim view of employers, you know, just trying to avoid the application of the act. Um, but surely that would be, you know, a factor that would be taken into account. And yeah, so I think if you become an, a designated employer by April, you stay it until October. But yeah, if you if you fall below and significantly below again, you know, then you are no longer a designated employer. Um, don't have guidance from the department in this regard or from the courts. So yeah, I think one needs to take a cautious approach and a sensible approach to this. Because also, you know, there are lots of obligations on designated employers, committees and consultation and all of those things. Yeah, let's give this proper thought. Thanks, T, for that assistance, and I guess we'll we'll get more clarity um, in due course. Um, so a question for you to please um, just repeat um, the case um, so everyone can um, get what it is, and also a compliment for you. Fantastic summaries, Wu, very clear and succinct. Thanks, Lou. Um, so the case is Department of International Relations and Cooperation versus Lobsha and others. Um, what, what maybe we can do, Lou, is, I don't know if they are able to see if we post something on the chat. Maybe we can post the citation on the chat or on the Q&A, we can just provide the citation. Yeah, the citations will be um, sent to all the attendees. So you will, you will all get the citations for all the cases um, by email. Um, some questions that have been added for you, Sbu. Um, also, can you please repeat, if an employer decides to not proceed with the inquiry for whatever reason, well, how should they inform the employee? Oh, I think this is a simple notice should suffice. Um, you know, the same way you would have given the, the employee a notice to attend a hearing, um, I'd say if you just send them a notice, that you were drawing the charges that should suffice. Two more questions for you, On the case, what recourse does an employee on the effects of the frivolous actions of the employer with the withdrawal of charge or abandoning a disciplinary process? So the question is what, what recourse does an employee have then? Unfortunately, there's no recourse. Um, because your, your, your employer is acting well within their prerogative. Um, you know, if they feel that they have a prima facie case to charge you, 
Um, and if at some stage it turns out that, you know, they, they were mistaken or it may happen that witnesses are no longer willing to testify and they might not be able to sustain the case. Um, so unfortunately, as the employee, you just you, you have to deal with whatever embarrassment um, that might come with that. But you certainly can't take there's no um, recourse in terms of the LRA uh, for an employee if an employer does not proceed with disciplinary charges. Thanks, Wu. Um, and just one more question. Um, please repeat the outcome of the Lapsha case, Mr. Dudo. Sure. So the appeal was uh, upheld. And then the arbitration award, sorry, the appeal was upheld. Um, the decision of the Labour Court was set aside and the arbitration award was confirmed. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Wu. Um, we'll now be moving on to a series of cases dealing with misconduct dismissals. Um, in this case, we'll be having three presenters, Swu, um, Ross Davey, who's a partner in employment practice, and Ayadan Kabinde, who's a senior associate in our employment practice. Thank you to you. Thanks, Lou. Um, so the next case is Endeto Engineering versus Metal Engineering Industries Bargaining Council and others. This is a review application um, that was brought to the Labour Court by the employer, and it concerned the question whether or not the arbitrator had actually made a reasonable decision in ruling that the employee's dismissal was substantively unfair. Very interesting uh, facts here, um, where according to Mr. Nkabinde, who's the employee who was dismissed, um, he was in the bathroom one day, busy relieving himself, and a Mr. Lovett, who happens to be the CEO of the company, actually peeked over the stall um, and was kind of having a look at him while he was busy in the bathroom taking care of his business. So Mr. Nkabinde was obviously very upset by this and he approached the shop steward and later that day he also approached his union externally laying a complaint about what Mr. Lovett had done. The union immediately sent an email to Mr. Lovett that same evening requesting that Mr. Lovett um, or rather demanding an apology from Mr. Lovett and which apology was not forthcoming because Mr. Lovett disputed what Mr. Gabinde had accused him of doing. Mr. Gabinde then lodged a grievance and Mr. Lovett's story, or rather Mr. Lovett's version was that he was in the bathroom round about that time, but that there was another employee, a Mr. Madwana, who would confirm and corroborate his version that he had just gone um, to another stall and he had not at any point, in, or rather he had used a urinal and had not at any point in time peeked over a stall to have a look at Mr. Nkabinde. So what was agreed at the grievance hearing is that the parties would submit to a polygraph test. Mr. Nkabinde agreed to take a polygraph test. He signed a consent form, which was provided by the company. And part of the consent form was a clause that stated that refusal to take the polygraph test would constitute a breach of the trust relationship between the employer and the employee. When the date came for Mr. Ngabinde to take the polygraph test, his union representative was not available. And so he was not comfortable to take the polygraph test without his union representative being available. This the company then saw or interpreted as refusal on the part of Mr. Ngabinde to take the polygraph test. And they said that any subsequent polygraph tests would be paid for, for Mr. by Mr. Nkabinde. And so the result was that Mr. Nkabinde did not take a polygraph test. Mr. Lovett did take a polygraph test, which showed that there was no deception on his part. Arising from that, Mr. Nkabinde was then charged with dishonesty 
for laying a malicious accusation against or laying a false accusation against the CEO of the company, as well as breach of contract for refusing to submit to a polygraph test. Mr. Gabinde pleaded guilty to the second allegation and he was subsequently dismissed. At the CCMA, the commissioner found that the dismissal was unfair and the company then took the decision on review at the labor court. Now the court then had to determine whether or not the arbitrator had acted reasonably. So the labor court found that the commissioner had actually considered the conflicting versions of the parties and that he had made credibility findings and in credibility findings, the commissioner had found that Gabinde was a more reliable witness compared to Mr. Lovett. In reaching this, in reaching this conclusion, the court considered the fact that the witness who was supposed to corroborate Mr. Lovett's version had actually conflicted the version that was given by Mr. Lovett. Mr. Lovett had testified that Mr. Maduana will be able to confirm that he used the urinal, he had not peeked over the stall, and that he had been in the bathroom exactly the same amount of time as Mr. Maduana. Now, Mr. Maduana was not able to confirm this version as he, he testified that they had actually come into the bathroom at different points in time and that he had exited the bathroom before Mr. Lovett. And so he couldn't confirm uh, Mr. Lovett's version. What was also important for the judge to consider, or rather what the judge found important was that the commissioner had considered the fact that Mr. Nkabinde had immediately complained to his union um, on two occasions on that day that, that he had lodged a grievance and that there was no reason that was put to Mr. Nkabinde as to why he would be making up the facts of this case. So having gone through the exercise of considering the conflicting versions between the parties, the court found that the arbitrator had not acted unreasonably in his finding that Mr. Nkabinde was a more reliable witness and therefore that there was nothing unreasonable about the conclusion that was reached by the arbitrator, that it was a decision which could have been reached by another commissioner. And as a result, the review application was dismissed. Thank you. Thank you, Swoo. Rose? Thank you very much. Um, thanks, Lou. Good morning, everyone. Um, so the case that I've been going to be dealing with next deals with collective misconduct and dismissals due to shrinkages being, um, um, being experienced by the employer. This is the case of Sakawu and others versus Patrick Percy Makobela and others. It's a decision by the Labour Appeal Court. <clears throat> Now, what happened in this case is the employer had a store in Kruger's door. Um, in about January, February, the employer did its stock tape and realized that there were shrinkages. Um, having considered the, the nature of this shrinkages, I think it was 0.48% uh, of total um, stock. Um, the employer was of the view that this was unacceptable and it was outside the range of what was considered to be acceptable um, stock losses. Um, the following month, a further stock take uh, showed that, that the stock losses were increasing. And by the third month, when the, the, there was a continuation of stock losses and an increase again, the employer had a shrinkages workshop with all employees in the store. Now, what is important to, to, to understand is this was a large store. I think the uh, I think it was about 1,200 meters squared size of the store, so it was large. Um, and during the, the workshop, the employer highlighted that there were um, excessive stock losses um, and you know went through the, the, the rule or the standard. Um, that was required of employees to meet when dealing with, with stock losses. 
Um, the interviews were held with the employees to ask what they thought the, the problems were, and the employees were required to fill out a questionnaire. Now, various issues were raised by employees in the questionnaires where they, they talked about lack of controls, lack of systems. Um, they said that there were um, insufficient, um, in, insufficient employees um, staff shortages, they said there should be a controller at the exit of the store to monitor what stock was going out, etc. So a number of issues were raised, which I'll touch on more as we go along. Um, notwithstanding uh, this, the employer then issued all employees in the store with final written warnings, uh, and the misconduct identified in the final written warnings were that the employees were failing to control stock losses. Notwithstanding these final written warnings, the stock losses continued. And at the end of the, the fourth month, I think it was, uh, it, there was a noticeable increase in stock losses. Um, it should be borne in mind that at this stage, the employer had gone through all the questionnaires, identified issues that were raised by employees, but hadn't done anything to address the, the issues raised. The employer then held a further uh, shrinkage workshop, uh, again, to sort of highlight that these stock losses were continuing and ultimately took a decision to discipline the entire workforce and all employees were dismissed, and they were dismissed as a group or as a team for failing to ensure compliance by the group with the performance standards applicable to shrinkages. The union, on behalf of the employees, then referred a dispute to the, the CCMA. Now, what was quite interesting at the arbitration, um, the, the company led evidence, and the evidence was these are the stock losses, this is the rule. No one has come forward. Um, and we are essentially going to, you know, we're dismissing for team misconduct or your collective misconduct. Um, the employer did, however, concede that apart from holding all employees culpable, um, they couldn't point a finger at any employee or at the group for theft or anything like that. And they admitted that they hadn't conducted any investigation into the cause of the stock losses. Um, and the, the, the manager went so far as to say he hadn't, they hadn't actually reviewed the, the CCTV footage to see if they could pick up um, what was causing the stock losses. The explanation there uh, for this failure was there's hours of CC, um, CCTV um, footage and it would just take too long to go through it to identify the problem. Now the commissioner um, at the arbitration took the view that um, no one came clean. So interviews were held, the questionnaires were, um, were, were completed, but no one came clean. No one came forward with any information to say, I saw so-and-so stealing or, you know, any of, or any, anything to say who could be implicated in it. Um, and he said, in, in actual fact, in responding to the questionnaires, the employees were really just trying to appoint fingers at everyone except themselves. So now just to look at what um, was raised in the questionnaires. So firstly, the employees have raised the issue that the receiving office was not locked. So anybody could go into the receiving office at any time. Um, when boxes were received into the, the store, these weren't checked. So there was no um, process to ensure that the right amount of stock was coming in. In addition, no key register was used and all employees had access to the keys to the receiving area. Um, they said no daily searches of employees were done. Um, there was a need for what they called an end controller at the exit to the store. Um, and they basically all said, look, we haven't seen anyone stealing. So that was what they had testified. Now, the, the, the commission or, or what they said in the questionnaires and then ultimately what they testified at, at arbitration. Now, what the arbitrator said is, well, from this, it's apparent that none of them were taking responsibility for locking the uh, receiving office, for ensuring that a key register is used, 
Um, none of the employees are taking responsibility for opening boxes to do a stock count and make sure that the right stock is coming in to the store. So he took the view that this was derivative misconduct and he characterized it as derivative misconduct. He found that the employees had failed to fulfill their duties um, to ensure uh, or to limit stock losses and therefore he found their dismissals were fair. Um, dissatisfied, the union took the arbitration award on, on review. The Labour Court took the view that the arbitration award fell within the bounds of reasonableness and dismissed the review application. The matter then went on appeal to the Labour Appeal Court. Now, the Labour Appeal Court then looked at the issue of collective misconduct. And one of the complaints raised by the, um, by the union was that the commissioner had mischaracterized the um, collective misconduct as derivative misconduct, where that was not actually the nature of the, the collective misconduct for which the employees were ultimately dismissed. So the, the Labour Court looked at the whole concept of collective misconduct and said that our law discerns four types of collective misconduct. One is based on the doctrine of common purpose. The next one is team misconduct. Then there is derivative misconduct. And then there is a fourth category that employers have at times relied on. And this is where they dismiss a group of employees for the operational requirements of the, the employer in circumstances where they can't identify the perpetrator of the, the, the misconduct. So with regards to common purpose, the um, court said that the doctrine of common purpose exists where there is deemed participation of the employee as part of a group in the act of misconduct. And in this regard, the, there needs to be direct or circumstantial evidence that the employees were associated with the misconduct. The employee must be aware of the misconduct. The employee must have a, it intended to make a common cause. So they must have illustrated that they actually supported the misconduct or you know, were, 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 were um, acting in common with the, perp the actual perpetrator. Um, and they must perform the, some action that associates them with the perpetrator. So that's your common purpose um, principle. Then with regards to team misconduct, this occurs where there are a number of employees who are disciplined collectively as a team for the same misconduct in circumstances where individual respondents can't be um, identified. So the individual responsible can't be identified. Now, common purpose may play a role in this, but it's not necessary for an employer to show common purpose in order to be able to identify the team misconduct. But what the employer would have to do is show that there is some culpability on the part of the employees who are being disciplined. The issue of derivative misconduct is um, misconduct by an unidentified perpetrator in circumstances where an employee has been told, you have information, you need to give me as the employer that information where the employee doesn't give that information, then they are charged with derivative misconduct. And um, what the LAC said, the derivative misconduct must only be used sort of when all other avenues have failed. Um, so it's really um, identified that derivative misconduct is an exception. It's an exceptional type of collective misconduct that an employer can rely on. And then with regards to the operational requirements dismissal, um, this, there have been cases of this, but the, the, the courts have found that this is problematic. And the reason for that is an operational requirements dismissal is a no-fault dismissal, whereas if there's misconduct, there is fault associated. And um, the, 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 the court was concerned that the only real thing that an employer can show in a dismissal of this type is that the selection criteria was subjective because it was based on a belief that there is some form of misconduct going on without linking employees to that misconduct. 
So the LAC sort of just gave a summary of these types of collective misconduct. And the LAC confirmed in this case that notwithstanding that the commissioner had mischaracterized this as derivative misconduct, what we were actually dealing with was team misconduct. The Labour Appeal Court said that in order to prove team misconduct, the employer had to establish that there was evidence of the, had to establish evidence of the failure on the part of the employee as a member of a team to adhere to a rule or performance standard relating to shrinkages. So they had to show that there was a failure by the employees. Um, they had to show that on the probabilities, the inference could be drawn that the employee was culpable or that there was some form of guilt on the employee's part, um, or they had to show that the employees were acting with some form of common purpose. Now, in this case, the, the LAC accepted that the rule relating to stock losses was not disputed and that stock losses were being suffered and that were increasing was also not disputed. So that was common cause. But the concerns that the LAC raised was that the employer failed to present any evidence regarding the um, details of systems and controls in place. So the employer had failed to say, look, we've got all of these processes, all of these controls in place to avoid stock losses. And notwithstanding this, we're suffering stock losses. Um, the employer had also failed to conduct any investigation at all and had failed to rely on CCTV footage in order to try and identify the cause of stock losses. Um, the court was also concerned about the size of, of the store and said that there was no evidence that employees in one section of the store would know what was happening in other sections. So um, that was, was problematic for the purpose of collective um, misconduct as well. Um, and then finally, the employees didn't stay, stay silent. It wasn't a scenario where the employer engaged with employees to find out the cause of, of stock losses and the employees just sat back and did nothing. So all of these um, led the LAC to a finding that the dismissals were unfair, that the employer did not establish on a balance of probabilities that there was team misconduct. Very interestingly, the, the, the judgment itself sets out a caution and says, employers must be cautious when relying on collective misconduct, as our law does not allow for the determination of guilt simply by association. The court also said there must be a factual basis or sufficient grounds for inferring that all employees are involved in the misconduct or that they are indivisibly um, culpable. And then the court said, you cannot rely on generalized facts. You need to go into specifics of the case. And in this case, there was just very general, we're suffering stock losses. Uh, we can't find out who those stock losses are because the employees have, uh, what the stock losses are caused by because the employees haven't told us. And therefore there is, um, you know, we're just going to dismiss everyone. Now, what is important from this is that if you read the case laws as they've been developing with regards to collective misconduct, our courts don't like collective misconduct. They don't like the, well, we can't identify a perpetrator, we're therefore gonna fire everyone. And although it is possible, and the LAC in this decision makes it clear that you can rely on team misconduct, you've got to do more. You can't just say, we've, got stock losses, therefore we're going to fire everyone because we don't know who's who's stealing. You've got to actually conduct a proper investigation. You've got to make sure you've got appropriate processes and systems in place. Um, you've got to, you know, if there are suggestions made as to what is causing the stock losses, implement the suggestions and look into it. Don't just disregard it. So, um, you know, just bear that in mind um, when, you know, if, if you face a situation like that, um, that you really do need to show that your team misconduct, your collective misconduct um, is actually the last result and that you can identify that there is some form of connection 
between the employees that you're seeking to dismiss. You know, very often when you're dealing with this team misconduct, you're dealing with dismissals of large groups of, of, of people. And your risk of a retrospective reinstatement down the line can have significant financial um, consequences. So it's always, you know, just, just bear this in mind and, and make sure that you've, you've, you've dotted your I's, crossed your T's, and done the necessary before you go down uh, a route of collective misconduct dismissals. Thanks, Lou. Thanks very much, Roz. Um, two questions um, on misconduct dismissals, one for you, Smoo, and one for you, Roz. Uh, Smoo, how does this case impact clauses in employment contracts consenting to polygraphs? While you think about that, question for Roz. What is the standard for proving derivative misconduct in the form of not informing the employer of other employees' misconduct? Must one prove that the employee knew but didn't tell of the misconduct, or is it possible to deem knowledge in this regard, i.e. the employee must have known and not told? So I'll start with you. Thanks, thanks, Lou. Um, so I think it's important to remember, and this is something that the court commented on, um, that polygraph tests are not conclusive evidence, right? So in this case, the, the, there was no expert evidence led. Um, and so without any expert evidence, the commissioner could not really place much reliance on a polygraph test. But as we would know, when it comes to polygraph testing, um, it's very, you actually cannot just dismiss an employee based on what a polygraph test states, right? So the impact or the effect of a polygraph test is that it corroborates other evidence. So certainly there's no, there's no reason why you cannot have a clause where employees consent to taking polygraph tests in the employment contracts, but it will be very difficult to then dismiss an employee um, for refusing to take a polygraph test because of the effect or rather the, the, the probative value of a polygraph test. Thanks. Okay. Um, thanks, Lou. All right. So the standard for proving derivative misconduct, I would say it's very high. Um, our courts don't like derivative misconduct. In my experience, um, you know, that it, derivative misconduct is sort of approached with a um, very, um, it's approached very cautiously by the courts. Um, and what the LAC said when describing der derivative misconduct was that it's misconduct. Okay, in such a case, the dismissal of an employee may be derivatively justified when misconduct was committed by others who have not been identified in circumstances in which the employee was expressly requested by the employer to disclose the information known to that employee pertinent to the wrongdoing, but consciously elected not to do so. So that is your test. So yes, there may be situations where um, the, you, know, you don't have actual proof and you can show that the, 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 the employee must have known based on factual circumstances, um, but you would need to, to convince the, 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 the court on a balance of probabilities that the employee did have that knowledge and that the employee willfully chose not to, um, to give you that information, notwithstanding an express request that they do so. Thank you. Ayanda, over to you. Morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and I think I should maybe begin by clarifying that I am in fact not the Mr. Nkabinde referred to in uh, Smoo's case. Um, but the case I'll be, or the first case I'll be presenting this morning is South African Municipal Workers Union on behalf of Malazi versus the Gert Sibande Municipality. And this case deals with the concept of double jeopardy. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, and this case deals with the concept of double jeopardy. And I mean, what do we mean by that? That is essentially, or what can be characterized as when an employer takes a second bite at the proverbial cherry. Um, so this case 
sorry, I'm just trying to, there we go. So this case uh, begins or in, has its inception in 2012 when the municipality at the time was alerted to possible fraud to the tune of 9.7 million rand. And so the municipality, of course, being alarmed by this, conducted an, an investigation, and they discovered that a particular employee's laptop had been used to try to access uh, the municipality's bank account 11 times. That employee was Mr. Malazzi, who was one of their accountants. So having found this evidence, the employer decided to charge Mr. Malazzi for a failure to act with honesty and integrity um, and an alternative charge of fraud. And he went through a disciplinary hearing and of course he was subsequently dismissed. The matter then went on to the CCMA. And what's perhaps critical at this stage to mention is that at the CCMA, Mr. Malazzi said that, well, he had been introduced to a culture of password sharing at the um, at, at his employer. So that meant, you know, it went as far as, you know, he had his password up on his calendar um, so that other employees could access it. And so essentially what the CCMA found, what the commissioner there found was that well, look, there was nothing to dispute this information. The commissioner found that whilst this conduct was reprehensible, dismissal would perhaps be too harsh. And that was primarily because if one were to accept that Mr. Malazzi had shared his password, then the company could not prove that he was the person who had tried to access the, um, the bank account of the municipality. And so uh, the dismissal was found to be substantively unfair, and the um, and, and the commissioner ordered reinstatement. And so the employer took the uh, the award on review, and the review application was dismissed. And so on the third of November, twenty sixteen, Mr. Malazzi was reinstated. Now, ah, there we go. Now, after his reinstatement, the company decided that you know there was there was still something they still had a bone to pick, shall we say, and so they decided that they would charge Mr. Uh, Malazzi with new charges. The first charge in, in this case was dishonesty because he had shared his password, and by doing so they believed that he had an intention to deceive the company. And then the second one was, the second charge was contravention of the IT policy. Of course, once again, he went through a, um, a disciplinary hearing and he was dismissed. The matter then went to the CCMA and this time the CCMA found the dismissal to be substantively and procedurally fair. And so it was Mr. Malazzi's turn to approach the labor court. And the main issue, in fact, what was in effect the only issue that stood for determination was whether the double jeopardy principle could be relied upon by Mr. Malazzi in this case. In effect, what he was saying was that he was being charged for conduct that um, for the for conduct that he had already been found ultimately not guilty of perpetrating. And so the labor court had to determine or had to consider that argument. And they said that, or what they began by saying was that double jeopardy is a valid defense for employees to rely upon, but it's not without its restrictions. And in fact, after an analysis of some of the jurisprudence in that regard, what the court found was that employers are in fact entitled to hold further hearings and impose harsher sanctions. But of course, as with all things labor law, we are constrained by the concept of 
fairness. This is also quite significant because what the jurisprudence used to say was that it was about whether exceptional circumstances existed. But um, this case uh, sort of underlined the fact that the standard is in fact fairness. And so what the determining factor here was, was that the court found that it was fair in this case to charge Mr. Malazzi again, because there was new evidence that had appeared after the charge, those initial charges. And that evidence was, of course, his admission that he had, in fact, shared his password with just about every Tom, Dick and Harry in the department. And so the court then found that um, on that basis, it would be unfair to say to an employer that if in uh, arbitration proceedings at the CCMA, evidence arises um, that amounts, in fact, to an admission of guilt, uh, that that employer cannot take future steps against that employee. And on that basis, the employer found that it would that it was in fact fair to charge Mr. Malazzi and to dismiss him on these new charges, which were related in this case to the sharing of the password, which of course wasn't something that was considered in the initial charges. And yeah, um, that's that case. Thank you, Lusanda. Very interesting. Thank you, Ayanda. We're going to be moving on now to the topic of unfair discrimination. Um, in this regard, uh, Talita is going to be one of our presenters, as well as Melissa Koga. Melissa is a senior associate in our office in Cape Town. Thanks, Talita. Thanks, Lou. Um, I'm also not related to Mr. Lopesha in the previous matter. <laughs> um, just quickly, two questions that came up from the Employment Equity Amendments. The first is whether uh, sexual harassment is something um, that may be taken into account in issuing the certificate and whether if the company has sexual harassment matters against them in the form of arbitration awards, that is something that the, uh, may influence the issuing of the certificate. Yes, it is. Sexual harassment is a form of harassment. Um, like race harassment, religion, language, any other basis of harassment, as we see in the Code of Good Practice. And it will be important that you revise the, uh, your, your policies in line with the revised code. Um, then the question is what if we have a case against us uh, or, or a, a, an award that went against us, but we are challenging that award, would that be taken into account we will need to see. Um, the section suggests that the minister can publish a code of good practice that sets out what factors to be taken into account in assessing compliance with chapter two and three, possibly having taken the matter on review or appeal under section 10 of the Employment Equity Act would be a relevant factor to be taken into account, but we will need to wait for that code of good practice. Then there was another question in relation to consultation obligations. Um, it is important to note, Sepo, that um, the consultation uh, section 16 hasn't been amended. So it still refers to a representative trade union. Also, I had a quick look. The definition of a representative trade union hasn't been amended, and that refers to um, one union or two or three unions or more acting together, representing the interests um, or that, that are sufficiently representative. So it's, it doesn't refer to majority um, union representation. And then that must be read together with section 16.2. So even though you might be required under section 16.1 to consult with that representative trade union, um, you still need to make sure that that who you are consulting with represents the interests from employees across all occupational levels from designated groups and employees who are not from designated groups. So those principles are still in force. So now moving on to the interesting Sorry, matter. Team, of before you move on, before you move on, a question's come on for Ayanda. We can just deal with it before we move on to the next topic. 
Um, and it's a quick one. Hi there, Ayanda. So please clarify, you are saying that the Labour Court says that you may charge for further misconduct if there's new evidence and the employer can issue new charges and it won't be considered double jeopardy. Uh, yeah, in effect, uh, well, I'll start by giving the, the lawyer's answer uh, and say it depends. Uh, but in effect, um, that is what the court was saying in this instance, um, given that new evidence, which actually amounted to an admission of guilt of a, a, another kind of charge, albeit in relation to the same conduct. Um, arose, uh, but of course it would be determined on a case by case basis. Yeah. Then we are moving on to an equal pay case. It is a labor court decision. And in the matter of Sakawu, Sakawu seems to have been um, visiting the court quite uh, frequently. <laughs> uh, Sakawu versus Makru. And this is um, a case that has its roots in a payslip on the printer. Please don't leave payslips on the printer. <laughs> we can just agree on that. But yeah, there were three merchandise controllers who from this payslip saw that another merchandise controller earned more than they, that they were earning and they were aggrieved by that. Um, they were of the view that this was because of race, because the comparator was a white female, Miss Nadine Suku. And they then, on, in April 2018, lodged a grievance, and the company considered it. They looked at um, the merchandise controller situation in relation to pay. They adjusted salaries, they introduced a range of salaries, a grade, and one of the important things that they took into account also was tenure. So Masuku had been employed since June 2011, and that then resulted in, in the new pay structure. Even though the salaries were adjusted, these five merchandise controllers were not happy. And they said, no, this is the, the difference in pay between us is because of race. In the court, the employer said, no, it is not because of race. It is because when we appoint merchandise controllers, well, in the past, it worked like this. We asked for that applicant's space and then we tried to match their previous salary and not give a higher salary by more than 15%. And that we applied across the board. So the, the differences in pay are not because of race, but is because of this practice of us trying you know, to accommodate people with regard to what they were earning just before they applied for a job with us. And importantly, the court said, if we look at all of the facts, yes, it is so that these five are earning below what Masuku is earning, but there are two other employees who are earning more than they are earning and more than what Masuku are, is earning, and they are black employees. So it is not because of race that Nasuku is earning more. It is because of this practice in the past and in any event, the employer has now taken steps in order to establish a grade and make sure that all of these um, employees remuneration fall within this range. And because the reason for the differentiation wasn't a prohibited reason like race or gender or whatever, the court said no discrimination and dismissed the case. Now you might be aware that there was an article written by Philip the Force, no, no, Pierre de Force. Philip de Force is a, is a storyteller. Pierre de Force and um, 
some of his colleagues wrote an article saying, but actually you missed the point, Labour Court. This is a form of indirect discrimination because people from, you know, uh, if, if, if this is your, your, your rule, then people who previously earned higher salaries are now going to continue to earn high salaries. And generally speaking, black people earn lower salaries than white people. And you are just going to perpetuate this uh, discrimination. Now, we have dealt with a matter concerning indirect discrimination over the past couple of years for a client. Indirect discrimination is not just a thumbs up and generalizations about some people, you know, historically this and historically that, and now therefore this employer is unfairly discriminating. Indirect discrimination requires proof that there is a disproportionate impact on a particular group through the application of a neutral policy. And what you would need to do is to have evidence of this practice. White people being benefited from this practice and black people being disadvantaged through this practice. But there needs to be a comparison of, a comparison of the proportions it isn't sufficient just to make generalized statements about what happened in the past. If you have that evidence, yes, by all means, bring it. And bring a claim then based on indirect discrimination. But there was nothing before the court in relation to that practice being um, a neutral ground that has this disproportionate effect. It was a pure case of direct race discrimination. And the court said, that case wasn't me. That race wasn't the reason. It was another reason. And if the, the union wanted to bring that other case, it needed to amend it. Thanks, Rita. Um, a question for you. Is there a duty to move to equalize the remuneration over time, despite the reason for the difference not being related to a prohibited ground? I think the important thing is that we, we must be sure that we are talking about employees doing the same work or similar work or work of equal value. That is the first thing that we need to assess. The second thing is we need to make sure that the reason for differences in pay is an objective reason. It is not related to uh, one of the listed grounds or an arbitrary ground that affects your human dignity in a comparably serious way. If we are clear that differences are based on seniority, length of service, um, the quality and the quantity of performance, those kinds of reasons, then it is in order to differentiate. When it is not in order to differentiate is when we are discriminating unfairly. Alyssa? Thanks, Lysander. Good morning, everyone. I'm going to be discussing the case of Tanda versus the member of the Executive Council in the Department of Health. It's a decision from late last year by Judge Lally in the Labor Court. And it's a case that deals with protected disclosure made by an employee and then the subsequent harassment and unfair treatment she received as a result of the protected disclosure that she had made. So in this case, the employee was appointed as a data capturer at a community health center. Then she was later seconded to the district human resources department, and she was responsible for the recruitment of staff. And she stayed in that position for four years. And during that time, she managed the recruitment and selection process, she placed advertisements for post, and she appointed and managed selection panels for the shortlisting of candidates. 
Then there was an advert for an administrative clerk post. And following the shortlisting process, one of her colleagues looked at the list of the shortlisted candidates and was upset that her niece, Mrs. M, was not on that list. She then received a telephone call later on that week from the chairperson of the selection panel who instructed her to add the employee's niece to the shortlist. The employee refused to do so because she said that this contravened the HR policies and procedures, and essentially it resulted in nepotism. She then reported the incident to her manager who expressed her discomfort at intervening in the manner and she advised the employee to call a meeting of the selection panel, which she then did. Eventually, the, the panel took the decision not to appoint the niece or to shortlist her. However, after that, this employee's manager began to intimidate and treat the employee unfairly. So her files were removed. She was chased out of departmental meetings. She was denied access to the personal system, and she was removed from the department's WhatsApp group. She then lodged a grievance against her manager, and it was recommended following that grievance that she be sent back to her old position as a data capturer at the community health center. And then she was then transferred back to that role that was four years. She'd been in the HR position for four years. She'd been transferred back to a data capturer role. She then approached the labor court, claiming that her removal and transfer from the HR department back to the data capturing role constituted an occupational detriment as a result of her having made a protected disclosure. So she's obviously there relying on the relief that's provided in the Protected Disclosures Act, which protects employees if they've made a protected disclosure from experiencing an occupational detriment and being transferred to a different division against your will is considered an occupational detriment in terms of that act. The court was satisfied that she had actually made a protected disclosure. What she was instructed to do was essentially to be complicit in nepotism, which was in violation of the recruitment policy, and that that report was made in good faith um, and it was made in her capacity as an employee, and it was made to the employer, just in the manner that is contemplated in the Protected Disclosures Act. They also accepted that she had suffered an occupational detriment as a consequential result of that disclosure. And the court said that she had worked in that HR department for four years without any complaints about her ability to perform her duties in that role. And the court believed that she was removed from HR as a result of a punishment from having made that disclosure. And the court in that instance stated that she was subjected to indignity, humiliation, bullying, and hurt as a result of the protected disclosure. And they awarded her compensation of 10 months of her remuneration and ordered reinstatement back into her role in HR. Thanks, Lou. Brilliant. Thanks, Melissa. Um, we'll now be moving to a case dealing with the concept of objecting to con -op. Um In this regard, Nuria Gavinda, who's an associate in our practice, will take us through the case. Thanks, Nuria. Thanks, Lou. Morning, everyone. So the case that I'm discussing is called Valinor Trading versus the CCMA and others. It is a review application from the CCMA. And the application was essentially to review and set aside a rescission ruling. And the essence of the case discusses what discusses um, whether a commissioner is empowered to ignore an objection on the basis if it was raised late, meaning within seven days from the date of an enrollment of a matter. So as you may know, the CCMA uh, Rule 17 states that should an employer or um, a party to a dismissal dispute wishes to object to arbitration, um, sorry, arbitration commencing immediately after conciliation, where the matter is unresolved through conciliation, an objection must be raised by written notice to the parties and to the CCMA within, um, sorry, seven days prior to the uh, enrollment date. So in this particular case, the applicant only objected 
three days before the enrollment date. And they objected in terms of section 1915 capital A C of the Labor Relations Act. And so even though they have obje objected, the commissioner found that their objection was invalid because it did not fall within the prescribed timeline of the CCMA rules. And so the commissioner proceeded with arbitration in the absence of the applicant. And uh, the, the commissioner thereafter awarded handed down a, awarded a default arbitration award against the applicant. And so the applicant applied for the default award to be rescinded. However, the commissioner also dismissed that application. And so the main question that the court, in, the labor court had to decide was Resting on the interpretation of section 1915 AC of the Labor Relations Act and how it conflicted with the CCMA Rule 17. So the judge says that once a party objects to arbitration, it cannot lawfully commence because a right is afforded in terms of the LRA for uh, an employer to, or employer or employee to object to conciliation proceeding, I mean, sorry, to arbitration proceeding. So the section and the section itself of the LRA does not prescribe a time period within which to object. So the CCMA rules of conduct are discretionarily published to regulate and not prescribe the CCMA proceedings. So a commissioner cannot be held captive by a time frame that is prescribed in the rules. It is also suggested that not suggested, it's in the act, that um, a commissioner must have regard to substance over form. So in this case, substance would be our act and form would be the rules. So that tells us that the legislature affords substance of the act to prevail over the CCMA rules. This is also in terms of section two, I think it's 210 of the LRA. So if we look at that, if we're looking at substance, the court says that substantively the LRA does not allow arbitration to proceed where another party has objected. And if we look at um, rule 17, it doesn't actually say that an objection becomes defective um, to the point of it being ignored uh, if it can if it is outside, if it is within seven days of the enrollment date. So any constriction that must be given to provisions of the rules of the CCMA must as far as possible be a construction that reconciles the rules with the act rather than placing the rules on a, what the judge says is a path of collision with the act. And so a party who objects acquires the right not to have the arbitration proceedings commence. Such a right cannot be ignored. And this right, as mentioned, stems from the LRA. So, and the court also says that if the drafters of the rules intended for um, an objection to be considered invalid, if it is not within the prescribed timelines, it would have explicitly stated this. And so uh, what happened in this case was the commissioner had said the objection was invalid. And the court says that the commissioner had no power in terms of the section or the act to actually commence arbitration immediately after conciliation. Doing so, he acted outside of his function. And so it can't be said that the, an objection outside, uh, within seven days is null and void. So in this case, the court rescinded and reviewed the rescission ruling of the commissioner, but also replaced that ruling with a default award. Um, sorry, replaced the default award with a rescission and also set aside that default award. So in essence, um, this case is important because it tells us that an employer who lodges an objection to arbitration commencing immediately after conciliation is not fatal, even if it is brought within um, 
seven days before arbitration. Thanks, Maria. We still have a number of questions coming through on topics and cases that we've dealt with. Um, unfortunately, we won't be able to deal with all the questions. We still have a fair number of cases to deal with within the allocated time um, of the webinar. We're making sure that we are dealing with some of the questions, at least in relation to all the cases and topics, um, but unfortunately, we won't be able to deal with each and every single question. Up next, Roz will be dealing with an important case um, on strikes and the use of replacement labor um, and when the use of replacement labor is allowed and when it's not allowed. Thanks, Roz. Thanks, Lou. Um, so this case is Nunza versus um, Trendstar, and it's a decision by the Constitutional Court. It's a very important judgment and a somewhat concerning judgment, or certainly concerning, I think, for employers. So this case involves a, a demand about, uh, or for a demand by the union for a once of gratuity payment to be um, paid to its members. Now, um, before we go into the facts of the case, what is important is the definition of what is a strike. So a strike is a complete or partial concerted refusal to work over a mutual interest demand or over a grievance. Now, we all know um, that an employer is entitled to employ replacement labor when it is faced with a strike, um, notwithstanding that the right to strike is constitutionally protected. A lockout, on the other hand, is the exclusion by the employer of employees from a workplace to compel the employees or the union to accept a demand of a mutual interest um, that the employer has put down. The general rule with regards to lockouts is that you may not employ replacement labor. So where uh, employees go on strike, you can employ replacement labor. Where you lock out the employees, then the employer may not um, em employ a replacement labor. There is one exception to, to that rule um, with regards to, to lockouts. And that is where the strike is in response, uh, sorry, where the lockout is in response to a strike. Um, it's what we call a defensive lockout then the employer is entitled to use replacement labor. So this will come in, become important as I go through the facts of the case. So after the failed conciliation over this demand for a once or gratuity payment, NUMSA issued a strike notice to the employer and the employees embarked on a strike. Now, I think the strike proceeded for about a month and um, thereafter, NUMSA sent a letter to the employer and said that a decision had been taken to suspend the strike. Uh, and thus employees would return to work on the following Monday. Um, but it was made very clear in this letter that they were not withdrawing the demand and that they were not viewing the dispute as having been settled. The effect of a suspended strike is that the strikers can go back on strike at any stage thereafter. So there is a potential for uncertainty, um, you know, with regard to continuation of, uh, of business practices. In order to address this, and in order to finalize the dispute, um, at this stage, the employer had replacement labor in place. So they wanted to continue with the operations without the possibility of a future disruption or further disruptions down the line should the employees go back on strike. So they issued the employees with a lockout notice and they said that the lockout would start at the same time that the employees had tended to return to work. The company also stated that they would continue to employ replacement labor because the lockout was a defensive lockout and um, they were locking out in response to the strike action. NUMSA disputed the company's right to employ replacement labor um, and said that in light of the fact that the strike had been suspended, any lockout thereafter would be an offensive lockout 
precluding the use of placement uh, labor. And then the union approached the labor court to interdict the use of replacement labor. Now the labor court looked at the definition of strike, the definition of lockout, and then the, 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 the provisions of the Labor Relations Act that provide that an employer may not, as a general rule, um, employ replacement labor where there is a, um, where there is a, a lockout. Um, and then looked at the meaning of a lockout in response to a strike. Um, and, you know, it, it becomes quite technical here because there are different, there are, I think, two conflicting cases. One where the Labour Court has said, no, once there is a strike, if you lock out in response to that strike, even if the strike comes to an end, the lockout can continue because the lockout was called in response to the strike, it is therefore a defensive strike, and the employer can continue to employ replacement labor. Whereas there's another case that finds the opposite and said, well, once the strike comes to an end, um, then the lockout becomes an offensive lockout. So the labor court considered this and said, look, you know, essentially the purpose, well, you know, where uh, defensive lockouts are very often used, the employer can take the power back as to when the employees can come back to work in a, uh, uh, you know, put them in a position to uh, make that decision um, as opposed to allowing the employees to make the decision. Now, the Labour Court accepted that allowing replacement labour in such circumstances would weaken the union's bargaining, or, you know, collective bargaining power. Um, because now the employer is controlling when employees come back to work as opposed to the, the union doing so. However, the Labour Court said that that notwithstanding, the LRA had specifically provided for defensive lockouts allowing replacement labour and basically said that if the ability to employ replacement labour uh, was prohibited once the strike was suspended or terminated, this would render the lockout provisions or the provisions that you can employ replacement labor in certain lockouts would, would render them nuggetary. So the court said, no, you know what? Uh, they can continue to employ replacement labor. In response to this, NUMSA then withdrew the demand so that the employees could go back to work. So they went back to work. Notwithstanding that the strike and the, the lockout had now ended, NUMSA approached the Labour Appeal Court to say, this is a matter of a public interest. This needs to be determined. The Labour Court decision is wrong. The Labour Appeal Court declined to um, determine the appeal on the basis that it said the matter was now moot because um, the employees were back at work. The union then appealed directly to the Constitutional Court and the Constitutional Court accepted that it was a matter of constitutional importance that needed to be determined and that it thus had jurisdiction. Um, and essentially what the Constitutional Court was required to determine were two things. One, did the suspension of a strike mean that the lockout became an offensive lockout? And two, was the fact that employees um, could continue with the strike at any stage sufficient to allow um, the interpretation that the lockout is still uh, defensive and thus replacement labor can be employed. As I have already said, there were two conflicting labor court judgments on this, where the case in Timani said that um, the replacement labor would be permissible because what they said is, once there is a strike and you lock out in response to that strike, the lockout is defensive. That doesn't change the character because suddenly the employees decide to go back to work. Uh, and the, the, the LRA is capable of being interpreted in that broad way. Sun International case, on the other hand, looked at a situation where I think a strike was terminated and said that once the strike came to an end, and the employees tendered their services. If the employer persisted with a lockout, um, then or, or implemented a lockout, then it would become an offensive lockout and replacement labor would be precluded. 
Now, the Constitutional Court considered various issues, and one of those issues was whether there was a distinction between terminating a strike and suspending a strike. So if the strike is terminated, would that be different to if the strike, as in this case, was suspended? And the court actually said, no, look, it matters not. Um, what you have to look at is what is the effect of the suspension and what is the effect of the termination? And when you look at the definition of a strike, which is the partial or complete concerted refusal to work, once the strike was either terminated or suspended, there was no partial or complete refusal to work. So the strike then ceases. Um, the Constitutional Court accepted that the, um, that the decision in, in Tamani was capable of being substantiated, that you could interpret the LRA to say, well, the fact that the strike then subsequently comes to an end doesn't mean that the, um, that the lockout becomes an offensive lockout. But then looked at various issues to say, well, is that the right interpretation? And the court considered firstly, that the right to strike is a constitutionally entrenched right. Um, it should only be limited in very specific circumstances as set out in the LRA. The right to lock out employees, on the other hand, is not a constitutional right. It is a right that arises out of the LRA, and there are very specific rules. There is no real distinction between suspending or terminating a strike. So whether it's suspended or, termi uh, or terminated matters not to the determination. The fact that the, um, a suspended strike can continue at any stage doesn't render uh, or doesn't, isn't relevant for the purposes of this determination. So the court wasn't interested in the employer's argument that look, now the strike can go on, there's no certainty. The, 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 the court said, well, that's the employee's right. They, they have a right to continue with that dispute. And then the court said, that although there are two different potential interpretations of the LRA, one being um, the, the Tamani interpretation that the lockout can continue as a defensive lockout, and the other being the Sun International one, which says, well, once the strike, once there is no longer a um, partial, complete, concerted refusal to work, then there is no defensive lockout. Um, the court said what you've got to do is interpret it narrowly in order to give the greatest protection to the constitutional right to strike. And the, the court said that because there is no constitutional right to lockout, then the provisions of or the lockout provisions will be narrowly construed, whereas the right to strike must be uh, widely construed. And for this reason, um, the court ultimately found that once the strike had been suspended, the employer was on a defensive, um, an offensive lockout, and there was no right to employ replacement labor. Interestingly, one of the other things that the court noted is the ILO provides generally, or well, the general rule in terms of the ILO provisions is there is no right to employ replacement labor in a strike because they believe that that takes away or diminishes the, 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 the bargaining power of employees who are on a strike. And although the LRA departs from that, um, it must then be narrowly construed in order to have the least chilling effect on the right to strike. So in the circumstances, there's no right to replacement labor. And then the, the, this begs the question about what happens with grasshopper strikes. Now, the court did consider grasshopper strikes. So we often see a lockout in circumstances where there's a strike, but employees strike, then go back to work, then strike, then go back to work. Um, and that is the, then, I suppose, the partial concerted refusal to work. Um, so there, it appears to be that the court accepts that you can use a defensive lockout there. But I think we're going to find that it's sometimes going to be difficult to determine, is it a grasshopper strike 
or is it a true suspension of a strike? So I think we're going to have difficulties down the line. Um, where a defensive lockout, however, will be will still be used or can still be used is where you have go slows, um, where employees come to work, but they don't actually perform their full functions. Um, so we're going to watch the space and see how this is interpreted going, going down the line. But I do think it's going to have huge ramifications for employers when they um, choose to lock out employees. Thanks, Lou. Interesting and important judgment. Moving on to the topic of restraints of trade, um, Zawadi Jamini, who is a senior source in our practice group, will be taking us through the case. Thanks, Zawadi, for patiently waiting for your turn. Over to you. Thanks. Thanks, Sunda. Morning, everybody. Um, yeah, so I'm going to deal with restraints of trades, and I'm just going to go through it as quick as possible, which is an interesting time. So the case I'm dealing with is um, it's Abde Cables versus Lekhwala and another. It's actually quite very interesting. So it does deal with restraint of trade agreements. And in short, the employer in this, in this instance wanted to enforce a restraint of trade against its employee who had joined a competitor, who was about to join a competitor. And the employer, the employer and the new employee were both engaged in the cable industry. And they were both vying for a tender process, which was issued by ESCOM. Now, the argument that the the old employer was making is essentially this employee was privy to confidential information. It was privy to trade secrets and information which constituted proprietary uh, information and had a proprietary interest. Um, and of course, there was a restraint of trade clause uh, agreement in the employment contract. So essentially, they were arguing that, you know, this uh, clause should be enforced. And if it wasn't enforced, the employee would be precluded from being employed by a competitor for a period of 12 months and within South Africa. Now, as we know, um, a restraint of trade agreement is on the face of it's enforceable um, and it's on the onus of the employee to show that it is unreasonable. Now, a restraint of trade clause will not be enforceable if it doesn't protect a proprietary interest, right? So it simply seeks to stifle competition in most instances, that's what you know a court will find that actually what's being what's properly construed what's being done, it's that the employee is being restricted restricted from going to you know apply their trade elsewhere, which again is a constitutional right. So in short, there's a balancing um of interest that a court must make to determine whether restraint of trade agreement is enforceable. But again, the onus would be on the employee to show it's unreasonable. Now, very interesting with this case is. Basically, the argument that the old employer was making is that the employee had historical information, right? And again, I did say that essentially they were a major supplier to ESCOM and they'd been awarded a, a tender process or a tender in 2022. And the employee had played a pivotal role in that tender process and they had historical information pertaining to pricing, pertaining to you know, the strategy and the business operations. Now, there was a new tender uh, which was going to be issued by ESCOM in 2023 and the old employer and the new employer were both trying to get it. And essentially the old employer was saying that, look, well, you've now left our employee, you're gonna give the new employer a competitive advantage because you know our operations, you know our strategy and you know our pricing. And in short, they tried to uh, you know, enforce the restraint to protect its interests on that basis. Now, there've been cases where historical information does constitute or would constitute uh, a basis to enforce a restraint of trade. But, the, but in this case, the employee was able to show and distinguish that the tender process in 2022 and the tender process in 20, 2023 were completely different. So even though they had information pertaining to the 2022 process, it was very different to the new process in 2023. And essentially, there was no proprietary interest that was worthy of protection. And there was no basis in which it could actually give its new employer an advantage which again is very, very interesting because some cases would find that maybe there is a proprietary interest being protected and maybe um, there is a basis for um, you know, a court to enforce uh, uh, the restraint of trade. But in this case, um, the court found that um, there wasn't a proprietary interest and it was clearly distinguishable. These, these situations were clearly distinguishable and the uh, employee uh, could not give the new employer uh, an, an advantage. And I, I think really the takeaway is you know, restraint of trade cases 
are all they're all dealt with on a case by case basis. It's difficult to determine at the outset what a court will find. What we do know is there is a balancing um, of interests. There are balancing of factors. Um, and what we can take away from this case is that historical knowledge did not constitute a basis to enforce the restraint of trade. And that's the case. Thanks, Lou. The next two cases deal with the refusal to work overtime and an employer's obligation to provide adequate training. Um, both of them will be dealt with by Melissa. Um, in the interest of time, Melissa, please, can you do them back to back? Thanks. Thanks, Lucinda. So the first case which relates to the refusal to work overtime is the Association of Mine Workers and Construction Workers Union versus the CCMA. It's the decision of this year uh, in February. And in this case, Andrew's mining site manager asked workers to put in two hours of overtime after knockoff, and four AMCU members refused to do so. Um, they had re listed reasons as to health and safety concerns in terms of the Mine Health and Safety Act, and they were then dismissed for gross insubordination. The union argued at arbitration that they could not have been found guilty of gross insubordination because the instruction to work overtime was an unlawful instruction. Um, and the Labour Court found that there was a concession that the contract of one of the workers contained no requirement to work overtime. And those workers which did actually have the, the requirement to work overtime had not actually been renewed in terms of the BCEA, which requires a renewal annually. And it was only in respect of one of the employees where there was a valid instruction to work overtime because there was a valid contractual obligation to do so. Now, in terms of the BCA, employees can't be required or permitted to work overtime unless there's an agreement to do so. And the court looked at what is insubordination and whether this amounted to gross insubordination. So the court said, aside from the fact that the instruction was not lawful or reasonable, it was grossly unfair to have dismissed these employees and dismissal was a disproportionate outcome to a refusal to work two hours of overtime. So that in a crux is that case. Um, I'm going to swiftly move on to the next case, which is Hobongwa versus Bentele, South Africa. It's also a 2023 decision, but it's a decision of the Eastern Cape High Court. And it's an interesting case. It deals with damages and an occupational injury. But in this case, the employee was an employee of a labor broker and was placed at a client. And at the client, the employee suffered a workplace injury. And he had sued the client for damages as a result of that injury. He was using machinery that he said that he had not been trained to use. And the labor, uh, sorry, the Eastern Cape High Court agreed with the employee that he had not been trained, that the client had a duty to train the employee on how to use the machinery, and that had it done so, um, the, the harm that was caused to the employee and which machinery, machinery fell onto him could have been avoided. So in that case, the Eastern Cape High Court confirmed that he could claim damages and that was set aside for another decision in terms of damages to be proven. So this case is relevant for clients who use labor brokers. Um, you know, in terms of the Compensation for Occupational Injuries and Diseases Act, the employer is the labor broker, not the client. So clients who are using labor brokers and who have workers on their premises must make sure that they have appropriate occupational health and safety training, how to use machinery, provide a healthy and safe work environment, and then also make sure that they have appropriate insurance policies in place to cover them for those kinds of uh, claims of damages that might take might take place at their workplace or ensure that there's appropriate indemnities in place in their service level agreements with the labor brokers. Thanks, Lee. Our pen ultimate case, which will be dealt with by Ayanda, deals with the important distinction between employees and independent contractors. Thanks, Ayanda. Sure. Thanks, Lucinda. Let's see if Zawadi and I can split three minutes. Um, 
So this case deals, of course, as Lucinda said, with the distinction between independent contractors and employees. And I think the real value of this case is that it really does illustrate the, the nature of the analysis that ought to be conducted uh, when assessing whether an individual falls within one of those categories. So just briefly stated, um, the facts are that um, Ms. Miller was engaged with, the, with, with uh, two companies as a sales consultant, so the contract said. Uh, and the general nature of the relationship was that she would be paid whenever she sent an invoice um, after she had rendered a particular service. And then on the 4th of February, 2019, she was served with a letter of termination. Uh, she subsequently went to the CCMA and referred an unfair dismissal dispute. And of course, the dispute was actually whether she was an employee, uh, which is a jurisdictional um, issue. And the CCMA, in its analysis, uh, the commissioner there, in his analysis, went through the factors set out in Section 200A of the LRA. And basically, what the commissioner there emphasized and found was that she was an employee because she had worked 40 hours a week, uh, those firms were the only basis for her income. Uh, she was part of the organ, or she could be construed as being part of the organization because she attended certain meetings. And also she had been provided with a laptop um, and an email address. Uh, and of course, the company agreed by this uh, decision, uh, which was ultimately that she was an employee and that she had been unfairly dismissed. Uh, took the award on review to the Labor Court. And here the Labor Court, again, emphasized a substance of reform approach. And in fact, what they said was that even though there are these factors that would determine where a person lies on the so-called spectrum, what's important is that some factors are more important than others in analyzing the relationship. And what was significant here was that at the beginning of their relationship, Ms. Miller had been told by these companies that she could do whatever she wanted to do, however she wanted to do, as long as she got results. And that was the basis on which the, the their understanding, or the basis on which they contracted. So the meetings that she did attend, she did so of her own accord because she wanted to. Um, and you know the hours that she worked, once again, because she wanted to, and that's what it had taken for her to do so and meet whatever her personal requirements were. Um, and then, of course, it was also significant that unlike any other employees, she was only paid on invoice. Um, and so then the court uh, found that actually the decision of the commissioner was an unreasonable decision and found that she was an independent contractor. I know that was very quick and I zoomed through it, but happy to chat another time over coffee with anybody. Thanks, Ayanda. Um, lastly, on the always exciting topic of cannabis, Zawadi, please close it out for us. Thank you, Lou. Um, in the interest of ending this webinar on a high note, I think it's quite appropriate that I chat about this. Um, so in short, what happened here is a review application and the employees <clears throat> had been dismissed by the employer for testing positive for marijuana. Um, at the CCMA, the arbitrator found that the dismissal was substantively fair. And now the Labour Court, essentially what the employees were arguing was that there's a constitutional court judgment which legalizes the uh, private use of weed. And in the circumstances, even though <clears throat> the employer's disciplinary po policy said that they can't report to work under the influence of drugs or alcohol, in the light of this judgment, they had not contravened the policy or in fact the law. In other words, the policy was actually in contravention to the judgment itself. Um, and they argued that marijuana was not a drug, uh, it was just a plant. And they'd been using this their entire life um, they've been reporting to work and had no issues, so it did not deter the performance. What was very interesting here was the court did consider that argument, but held that, look, in the light of the operations of the company, which essentially it was a manufacturer and it manufactured glass, so it was, you know, using very dangerous machinery, 
In the light of those business operations and the fact that it took the company took a zero tolerance to um, you know anything that would any substance that would impair your um, performance, uh, the, the the court held that it was a prerogative of a company to establish rules to ensure the safety of its, its employees, and this would also include precluding the use of um, you know cabinets, cap, um, marijuana, whether it was taken prior to coming to work or on the day of work, whatever it was, if you were tested positive for marijuana, um, uh, the employer uh, was within its prerogative to dismiss you based on its concerns to safety and the risk it posed in other people. And that is the case. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you, Zawadi. Um, that brings us to the end of today's webinar. Thank you to all our speakers. Thanks to all our listeners for joining us. Please join us again next time. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.